Hi everyone, my name is Sydney Yeager and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 24th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs are meant to illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism through time, and stories of resistance against injustice. Today's program is a continuation of our series about Nazis and fascism in the United States. As anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred continue to rise in America today, it is important to understand how we can, both as individuals and part of communities, stand up against these movements as the town of Southbury did. I would like to thank South Britain Congregational Church and the Jewish Federation of Western Connecticut for co-presenting today's program. Joining us today are Rebecca Erbelding, Ed Edelson, Arnie Bernstein, Belinda K. Elliott, and our moderator, Rabbi Eric Polikoff, founding rabbi of B'nai Israel of Southbury. If you have questions specifically for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm going to hand things over to Rabbi Polikoff. Thank you, Sydney, uh, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Rabbi Eric Polikoff of B'nai Israel in Southbury. About 15 years ago, I was asked how our local Jewish community had recognized the town and churches here for thwarting the German-American Boone's efforts to establish a camp here. We had it. So we researched the story, and from that time on, we have sought to champion this extraordinary example of taking a stand against Nazism. Through our efforts, I've had the good fortune of meeting our panel members, each of whom I hold in high esteem. It's an honor to introduce them to you. Arnie Bernstein, who amongst other works is author of Swastika Nation, an extremely well-researched and engrossing retelling of the history of the German-American Bund. Rebecca Erbelding, a historian, archivist, and curator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, who worked on the museum's exhibit, Americans and the Holocaust. She is also the author of the award-winning Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. Melinda Elliott, a local historian and president of the Southbury Historical Society, whose research on the town's encounter with the Bund will be published this fall and Ed Edelson, a former Southbury first selectman and author of Lois's Story, A Young Girl's Inspiration Helps to Stop Hate and Fear, that celebrates the role of the Lindsay family and town in overcoming the Bund. You'll notice that each is an author. <laughs> After hearing them this afternoon, I hope what you hear will prompt you to purchase their books. Now, as I shared what brought me to this story, I'd welcome uh, from our panelists, you're sharing with us your relationship to this story. Well, I'll go first, Eric. Um, and I, I'm very proud to have been one of uh, Eric's gang to bring this story to light over the last 15 years, uh, beginning with uh, his observation that he noted before. Uh, but uh, I think it's mostly uh, in telling the story to literally hundreds of different groups around uh, around the country uh, that keeps inspiring me because of the response of the people when they hear the story. Usually first being, I had no idea something like this happened in the United States, and then two, making the connection to what's happening today. So that keeps me moving forward uh, to continue to tell the story. I looked into uh, writing a comprehensive history of the Bund and their sweep throughout the United States in you know, learning the stories of the Bund and retelling them. There were also the people who stood up and fought back against the Bund. And the Southbury story is both captivating and inspiring um, and is an important part of the book and important part of the American story on how we you know, stood up against fascism in this country. I think my, mine is very similar to Arnie's. I, I look at American response to the Holocaust generally. And I think when 
a lot of people think about American response to the Holocaust, we take a very backwards look. It's really hard to not see what is coming. You know, we we think about the Holocaust, we, in our heads, we think of images of liberation. And I think it's really important to realize that that was not inevitable. It did not have to be that way. And so stories like the story of Southbury shows you what individuals could do, um, what power individual choice has. And so that, that was really what drew me to the story. My first encounter was helping the um, archivist um, process the collection, putting all the information together about the Bund into a, a, a good order. Um, it, it grabbed me, not just because of the story, but because of the people. Um, I got to see individually our, how individuals played a part. It was varied inter, um, individuals all together as a group that made a difference. Great. And, and I think that many of the people who are joining us uh, this afternoon may have had the opportunity to have already seen uh, S Scott Sniffen's uh, documentary, Home of the Brave. And uh, for those joining us who have not seen it, uh, we, uh, we really recommend you do it. It's, it's an outstanding piece. Um, but in case you haven't, or even in case you have, um, uh, let's go back over some of the basics of, uh, of what happened. And so um, in, in doing this, Arnie, if we could turn to you first, um, what was the German American Bund and how did it come to be and what was its message? Why are we talking about overcoming this organization? Well, the German American Bund uh, was an outgrowth of various pro-Hitler movements in the United States. Uh, the uh, Teutonia was a group that was formed in the 1920s. And a lot of these groups were formed as a result of World War I and the prejudices that were against Germans in America during World War I. They, you know, kind of banded together. There was, of course, the Van Steuben Society, which sought to, you know, rehabilitate the image of Germans in America. But then there were the ones who kind of banded together and looked to Germany and what was going on in Germany as their inspiration. Um, Teutonia kind of morphed into a group called the Friends of New Germany. Uh, the Friends of New Germany morphed into the German-American Bund. Fritz Kuhn, who was the leader of the Bund, was a German immigrant, um, a World War I vet. Uh, he claimed to have followed Hitler into the uh, Beer Hall Putsch. Um, of course, Fritz Kuhn claimed a lot of things in his life, so whether he was there or not, we don't know. Uh, he was most unlikely leader you could possibly imagine. Um, heavy set guy, thick jowls, thick German accent. Uh, and what led to the end of the Bund, he was a, uh, a terrible womanizer. He uh, came to America after being caught stealing from his employer in Germany. He went to Mexico, lived there for a while, and then he and his family came to America and went to Detroit where Henry Ford he got a job in the Henry Ford Hospital as a uh, x-ray technician. He had a master's equivalency of a master's in chemistry. While he was there, he became involved with the Friends of New Germany. And his contention was if they wanted to succeed as a group, they had to be more American in nature, hence the name the German-American Bund. When Friends fell apart, Fritz Kuhn saw his opportunity. He had a genius for organization. Um, for all his, you know, Nazism, he had a genius for organization, and he took this dying organization of the Friends of New Germany and he revamped it into the German American Bund. Um, they became a nationwide organization, well known um, throughout the country and well feared throughout the country. Um, there are various estimates to how many members there were. Um, is you know, Kuhn claimed there was you know 200,000 which of course was typical aggrandizing on his part um FBI thinks maybe around 15 uh there were various various estimates it was probably closer to 15 plus sympathizers the Bund was uh they had a series of camps around the country uh in uh Newark uh, or Camp Norland they had Camp Siegfried on Long Island uh, they had uh, Grafton, um, Grafton, Wisconsin, just north of me. I'm in Chicago. They uh, they had Camp Siegfried there, and they had, you know they had various um, other organizations. They had you know stores. They had newspapers, all sorts of things. At their height in 1939, they had a rally in 
Madison Square Garden, 20,000 people packed in there, but outside were 100,000 people who wanted to kill them. <laughs> they, uh, once they got, um, Fiorello LaGuardia was furious. They had the right to speak. Um, you have a right to be obnoxious in this country, but Fiorello LaGuardia was furious that this has happened in his city. So he and Thomas Dewey, who was then the uh, prosecutor, um, this is before he became governor, they concocted a way to how do we get Fritz Kuhn? They looked at him the same way they got Al Capone. They looked into his taxes. Uh, they discovered that the Bund had not paid taxes on a lot of things, but Dewey also said, this is, this is peanuts. Let's look for something bigger. Eventually they found that Fritz Kuhn was a womanizer, as I said before, and he was using Bund money to fund his romances. They got him on embezzlement. It was that simple. Um, after he was sent to Sing Sing, the Bund kind of flopped around trying to find new leadership. Uh, they didn't have anyone as, as magnetic as Kuhn. Um, and then when World War I broke out, the Bund fell apart. And, and Arnie, you, you mentioned the camps. What happened at these camps? And, and obviously the thing is going to be a camp in Southbury. Uh, what, right. What, what happened with camps? Now, they were ostensibly family retreats. And you would see the typical things you would see at any kind of uh, family retreat. There were, you know, uh, uh, you know, parties. There were, you know, gatherings. Uh, they had, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Oktoberfest kind of things. Uh, they had children's uh, camps as well um, with uh, cabins for the kids. They, you know, with swimming and archery and all these kinds of things. That was the surface. Uh, beneath them, though, they were Nazi training camps. There were swastikas everywhere. There were uh, speeches uh, with, you know, there were marches at Camp Norland, um, excuse me, at Camp Siegfried in Long Island. They had names like Hitler Street and Goebbels Street uh, lining the the various camp, the kids would be taken on marches in the middle of the night. And they, put, they in fact, the kids were the ones who built the camps. The parents had no say in the matter. They, you know, they, you know, they were going to use unions. Unions were full of Jews anyway, right? And so they, they had the children build the camps. And there was also a lot of sexual abuse that went on um, um, by the leaders uh, with, with the girls at these camps. Um, it was, on one hand, it was, you know, we are here for Germans and the German-American Bundes. On the other hand, it was a very dark um, and scary place, um, and 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 predatory. And yes, uh, Rebecca, how does the Bund sort of fit into life in 1930s America? Um, you know, uh, as a larger thing. Well, 1930s America is a really complicated place, and I think you need to look back. Um, to the 1920s to like really understand the context of the 30s. So the United States after World War I is incredibly isolationist. We have new laws that are based in eugenics, the idea that some people are biologically better than others. Anti-Semitism is on the rise throughout the 1920s and 30s. There's a new Ku Klux Klan that has millions of members in the 1920s. And so in terms of kind of racial ideology, the Bund is on the extreme end, but they are not the only one. There are a lot of really mainstream ideas here about race and racism um, that are pretty prevalent in the 20s and 30s. Um, many Americans, though, in the 1930s are distrustful of the Nazis. There actually is a lot of information that Americans could read about what was happening in Germany, about the early laws, um, early Nazi laws, kicking Jews out of the civil service, boycotting Jewish businesses. And there are marches and rallies throughout the country in the spring of 1933 opposing the Nazis. Um, but they're opposing not just Nazi anti-Semitism, they're opposing what they see as German militarism. And that, in, that carries on throughout the 30s. You know, as Germany starts to remilitarize, maybe not because of anti-Semitism, but because of deep isolationism that was prevalent in the United States. Americans don't want to get involved in a war. And so when we think about the Bund through the lens of the Holocaust, I think it's important to consider that some of the people who liked the Bund um, liked the patriotism that they saw. Um, they liked, as Arnie said, the permission to be proud of their German heritage, which during World War I, you know, there had been a lot of um, prejudice against Germany and attacks on German Americans. And so the Bund gave them this kind of pride back 
and they liked the feeling of power that being part of the Bund gave them. They had uniforms, there were marches, there were talks of you know, becoming a power again, becoming dominant again. Um, and some of the people who oppose the Bund may not have opposed their anti-Semitism necessarily, but they opposed what they saw as a German incursion into the United States and militarism, militarism both of Nazi Germany and of the Bund. And so it really is a kind of complicated period. And it's not just that people are opposing or joining the Bund because of anti-Semitism. Yes, and now, now the House Unaffairs uh, uh, Committee, actually, an American uh, committee, is established in part because of the Bund. Yeah, it's established in 1938 um, by a congressman named Martin Dees. And Dees is going after both fascists including the Bund and the Silver Shirts, which was another paramilitary group, um, and communists. Um, these did not like FDR, he did not like the New Deal, and so part of what this committee was investigating were these supposed communists who were infiltrating New Deal programs. Um, so he's trying to have it both ways, and it is to some extent a very political uh, committee, but they are going after the Bund again because of this militarism, not necessarily just the anti-Semitism, but because of this potential for um, German Nazi kind of invasion into the U.S., if not militarily, but culturally, um, that that Congress is trying to oppose at this point. So, um, so um, interestingly enough, so we have a sense of something of the Bund uh, and something of America. Um, and the Bund comes to Southbury, 1937. Melinda, what is Southbury like in 1937? Well, Southbury at that time was a transitional town. Um, and Sydney, if you can get the, the thing up, the picture. Um, in the previous decade, Southbury was home to two large factories. I know it's hard to believe in this little town that we had these gigantic factories. Um, after they shut down in 1926, the uh, many workers had to move away, uh, so where they can find work. The, um, th that left sort of the old families that were here from 200 years ago and included new immigrants, which was 32% of the town had at least one immigrant in each, in each household. Um, the new newly paved state road through the town brought tourists and of course, tourists need a place to eat and to sleep. And also, we had to have gas stations, um, which sprung up in various parts of town, along with auto repair shops. Now, South Ferry attracted a lot of new residents at that time, including the state veterinarian, the lead designer for Seth Thomas Clocks, and a large selection of, of New Yorkers, lawyers, doctors, and celebrities. Um, Southbury was experienced in overcoming hardships and, and reinventing the community to survive and to grow. Members of the German American Bund arrived in secret to purchase the land in Southbury and begin their campsite. The town was virtually unaware when the town mem the Bund members came to town for the first two Sundays. They, the Bund members mostly avoided the town and stayed on the back roads. And when the residents woke up one morning and found nation's largest pro-Nazi camp started in Southbury by German American Bund, they were very shocked and very surprised because most people had no idea this was going on. So of course, all the newspapers in, in the state had to send out their reporters. And the first question the reporters would ask, they'd go up to somebody and say, how do you feel about the Bund being here? And most always they had the response, no comment, because nobody knew exactly how to um, answer that question at that time. It was, it was such a, a new experience, something they never expected to happen in Southbury. Um, the official, the, the town, first the town official, the, the town official said that there would be plenty to say, to say when everybody decided that they knew what they wanted to talk about. So anyway, immediately after the newspapers um, were full of resolutions from different organizations that, that showed that the Bund was not a nice thing to have in Connecticut. 
In fact, the governor that week, the first week, the governor of Connecticut ended up with a, what they say an avalanche of letters protesting the Bund. So it wasn't just South Ferry that was protesting, it was the whole state um, did not want to be the gateway community for the, um, for the Bund. So numerous articles and editorials were, uh, had previously appeared about the Bund, but they also appeared at this reprinted and came back so people knew what was going on with the Bund. Overall, the town waited for their leaders to show some type of reaction. However, the official stance listed in the newspaper was from, from uh, the official saying, if they mind their own business, we'll mind ours. Which of course the town wasn't sure how to handle that. It's like, how do you, how are you supposed to feel when the leaders don't say anything? In a letter to an editor, a lady called, well, she wrote herself as a taxpayer and a mother stated, we cannot depend on the town leadership to do anything. What they didn't know at that time was that Ed Kaur, the first selectman of the town, already had a plan of action. He learned about the Bund the first day they came in town. Henry McCarthy, um, who had a visit from the Bund members, he went directly to Ed Kaur and told him what was going on. So in, the, in that first week, Ed Kaur was very busy. He contacted the FBI, the state police and, and town leaders in surrounding communities. And he learned from the FBI that the most effective way to stop the bond was to create a zoning code. So two days after the, the incident was in the newspaper, there was a notice in the, news, in the newspaper that a town meeting had been called for zoning to, to elect a zoning commission. Um, so CORE always held the belief that the town could handle their own problems as they came up and to do it legally. He contended that the newspapers sort of stirred up trouble. Um, so of course, perceived lack of leadership created a vacuum that others tried to fill. Reverend Lindsay felt that his congregation in the town needed direction and all the facts about the bond. He didn't wanna hide anything. He wanted to put it all on the table and let everybody figure out uh, to understand what was going on. While attending Yale, Lindsay, um, attended lectures by Nazi speakers and had the opportunity to have a say about what he thought about the Nazi leaders and about the Nazis. He was well aware also that in Germany, the pastors were being killed and the churches were, were being destroyed. And that's not something he wanted to happen in America, definitely not in Southbury. Lindsay took out his typer and began writing letters to the newspapers, the magazines, the congressman and the state governor. Lindsay, along with Reverend Manley, uh, did so, focus their sermons on uh, the Nazis and the Bund um, to give the people an idea of what was going on. Both sermons made headlines in the news, not only in Connecticut, but also across the country. This disturbed um, Fritz Kuhn, the Bund leader. In fact, he wrote and he said, Simultaneous, simultaneous attacks come from a Jewish judge in New Jersey and from a tiny community in Connecticut. Southbury was already making a difference. Melinda, well, thank you. Um, Ed, on Reverend Lindsay, um, uh, why was he such a hero? Well, I'd say mostly because of his courage because it's always the easy thing to just uh, put your head down, let these events go uh, over you and, and not get involved. And I think as Melinda discusses or mentions, you know, this sermon, uh, he really went all out and uh, I encourage people uh, to read the sermon. I would also say and uh, encourage everyone to go see the wonderful exhibit at the Holocaust Museum, because uh, again, a lot of the work by Rebecca you see how much information was out there about the Bund and what and, and Nazism, but just because information is out there, galvanizing people to take action is a whole nother, you know, quantum leap. And somehow, and again, I don't think we'll ever know the whole story, Lindsay had the capability within the town 
uh, to put himself out there and galvanize the community to respond. Um, you know, I, I always love that phrase, a, a leader without followers is just a man out for a walk. Uh, and he did, uh, Lindsay, with his heroism to put himself out there, take the risks that he did. And again, this goes back to the point we made earlier. Uh, we look back on history a lot of times and think it's inevitable that things just worked out the way they did. He had no assurance that uh, his life would not be in danger uh, by the actions that he took. And yet... He felt uh, that he had to take a stand, and that's why I admire his, his uh, courage, and, and he's a hero to me. Um, the typewriter that uh, Reverend the Ed that referenced that Reverend Lindsay typed it on uh, apparently was a bit of a pack rat um, because uh, the typewriter is at the Holocaust Museum, uh, uh, and uh, among the various artifacts, the sermon kept in a um, uh, his um, kept it in a box, right? Uh, um, safe deposit box. Um, in that sermon, and I permit me just to say from, from a Jewish uh, point of view, um, and uh, as Rebecca pointed out, a lot of the anti-Bund activities were not necessarily anti uh, because of uh, uh, some uh, revulsion against anti-Semitism. Uh, what Re Reverend Lindsay does in that sermon is he says that to be anti-Semitic is to be anti-Christ. Um, and so uh, he makes a very explicit reference that way, which makes um, incredible reading uh, the, these many years later. So Rebecca, the sermons there, the typewriters there, um, why Southbury? Why was Southbury included? How, how is what's happening in Southbury different uh, than other places? Well, I also want to add in, not only does he pose this as it's anti-Christian, he says that anti-Semitism is anti-American, which, you know, if you look at American history, anti-Semitism is baked in. Um, American anti-Semitism rises and falls throughout the years, but it is fairly constant and on the rise. And so for a minister to come out, a reverend to come out and say, no, anti-Semitism is anti-American, that is a very strong statement to make in 1937. Um, Southbury is, is really, really interesting. Arnie talked about the locations where some of the other camps were. You know, Camp Nordland in New Jersey had 8,000 visitors just in July 1937, the same year that the Nazis tried to come to Southbury. Um, camp Siegfried in Yapank in, on Long Island um, was about the same size that Southbury would have been, that the camp in Southbury would have been. And that was a very popular place. There was a, a train direct from Grand Central Station on the weekends, the Camp Siegfried Special. Um, thousands of people went every weekend. There was a swimming pool and picnic grounds and parties. And the town um, of Yapank largely um, wasn't thrilled about having them there, but wasn't trying to kick them out in any, in any way. Um, an important consideration here that I should have mentioned before is that this is also in the middle of the Great Depression. And in the, the way that Yapank was thinking about it, these people, these are tourists coming and they will spend their money. You know, they'll come to local restaurants. There was a farmer who let people park in his field for 25 cents. Um, businesses were advertising in the Bund newspaper, knowing that this was a way to help their community during the depression. And so Southbury is actually turning that down, turning that kind of economic opportunity of having all of these people come deliberately turning it down. And we also know that the reverberations of that decision for Yapank, for the camp on Long Island, have reverberated to the present day. Um, the New York Times in 2015 discovered that there were still protective covenants in the area where the camp had been on Yapank that made it clear by law that said that homeowners had to be of German extraction to be able to buy homes there. Um, and so that legacy of racism and anti-Semitism that the Bund brought to Yapank um, is something that the, the community there has had to deal with for a long time. Um, and Southbury is, is specifically saying, we don't want any of the money that they could bring because we do not want their ideology. They are anti-Christian, they are anti-American, they do not belong in our town. Um, and that is a, a very strong statement to make, particularly in 1937. Eric, could I just, uh, there's a, it, an important question in the chat that I think uh, Melinda and I could hopefully clarify. 
the, there were two votes that happened at the town meeting. And again, we should point out the town meeting was attended by a, a very large percentage of the people living in the town. The first vote was on whether or not to establish zoning ordinances. And there were many people in town who were very much against zoning. As a farming community at that time, our understanding is uh, many of the farmers were opposed to the idea, or many of the residents were opposed to the idea of zoning. But there was a second vote on a resolution, uh, a resolution that went, uh, was addressed to the president and the governor of the state of Connecticut to basically say, stop this menace from uh, proceeding. And again, this is 1937. This is before a lot of people are speaking out. And that we understand was unanimous. So two different votes with a kind of different emphasis, if you will. Lynn, did I get that right? You did, you got it good. <laughs> so with this history, and um, we're gonna go quickly because of the time, but uh, uh, there's another element here of um, Southbury working to um, uh, disrupt the establishment of the camp by um, uh, and by um, the the various blue laws which were enacted uh, of, of actually utilizing them as a way of trying to prevent facts from being established on uh, on the ground. So um, that um, the good people of Southbury were taking every effort, uh, including some things which absolutely stretched um, uh, and then some uh, legality to try to uh, prevent the, the boon from establishing uh, a, a presence here. Um, now, now, Ed, you let, let's think, uh, and actually all of us, but, but I'd like to begin, Ed, with you, uh, some of the, the, the lessons from this. Um, it's an extraordinary story. And, uh, uh, and um, as Re Rebecca and Arnie explained, um, uh, why, Ed, uh, why did you write uh, uh, the, your book, uh, uh, Lois's Story? And I know that, um, uh, um, and again, small plug, Melinda has a book coming out uh, later this year. Um, Sure. Well, I'll take it. What did, what you know, you again, uh, you know, uh, Rabbi Eric and I, our story goes back to, you know, 2007, 2008, and then producing this movie in 2012. And, uh, you know, I had no thought of ever writing a story, uh, a children's story. But when I went to the exhibit at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. Uh, to see the exhibit open in April of 2018, I believe, and uh, was leaving the bookstore and uh, or going through the bookstore looking for books for my own grandchildren, it occurred to me that some of the, the really important themes of this story are not really accessible to young people through the documentary. And I think that's when, or I know that's when I said, well, that'd be a really good idea to have a children's story about this. You wouldn't go maybe into all of the uh, various aspects that Arnie and, and Re uh, Rebecca and Melinda have gone into. And that's where the idea came about. And then, and I don't know if uh, Sydney can bring up the uh, picture of uh, Lois maybe. Uh, well, this is the book cover and um, I'm very proud of the uh, fact that I was a finalist in the Connecticut Book Awards. But in all of our work on the film, we got the opportunity to re meet Reverend Lindsay's daughter, who the picture on the left shows her when she was about 10 years old living in Southbury. And the picture on the right is when she came to Southbury in 2012 for the premiere of the documentary, uh, obviously then 85 years old. And, uh, and I was really taken with Lois and, uh, and her perception about how important that story was. And Eric mentioned about the typewriter being kept. Well, it's not just that uh, Reverend Lindsay was a pack rat, his children <laughs> were pack rats and they kept everything. And although hardly anybody in Southbury knew this story, this family that had moved to Southwest Virginia, they remembered the story. They knew their father and grandfather uh, was a hero and what he did was important. Uh, and locally within their community, they would tell that story. Uh, and so the more I learned about Lois and her involvement with it, it just seemed like a natural uh, spokesperson uh, would be to tell this story through her eyes. Uh, and the fear that she felt for the, the German-American Bund. Um, you know, she didn't see it as just fun and games. She saw it quickly as a threat to her family and to her community. And that's one of the things I wanted to convey in this story. 
And how has this story influenced uh, uh, Southbury? Um, uh, uh, and uh, to answer one of the questions in the chat, um, Southbury was for a very short period of time at the central uh, at the center of the of the national debate in 1937. Uh, the nation honored Southbury uh, as sort of the the place of the year uh, uh, in, in in 1938. Uh, and if you visit Melinda uh, at the Historical Society, you'll see there are scripts uh, about uh, things from NBC and uh, the the New York Times and others weighed in on what was happening in Southbury, uh, but then it died down very quickly. But uh, having brought uh, the subject back, um, how has it, uh, Ed, from, from your sense, how has this influenced uh, uh, us now? What do we do with the story now? Well, it's been a, uh, you know, quite an interesting ride. I, again, I would go back to the premiere in, uh, in, back in 2012, uh, and I really think it was something that brought the community together and brought a lot of pride uh, to know that this story took place here, whether you had multiple generations living here before or if you just moved to the town recently. And so when uh, we had, you know, literally thousands of people see the film in the first couple of weeks when it was uh, available, including uh, filling up a thousand seat auditorium for the premiere, uh, I think everybody felt that pride. But these have been some pretty divisive years since 2012, and we've seen a lot of different uh, elements uh, and, and themes, let's say, appear in our community, including uh, uh, swastikas appearing from uh, time to time, uh, incidents of uh, anti-Semitism in the high school, as well as racism in the high school. And this story becomes a touchstone to help people come back and uh, think about that. Most recently, and if Sydney can go to the last picture, uh, in uh, 2021, uh, we saw some protesters come to uh, kind of our public corner uh, here in Southbury with a flag that uh, displayed swastikas on it. Uh, and a, a very hateful display and many other banners. This was not the only one. Uh, but this was recognized by our uh, selectmen, our board of selectmen, uh, that is, and I be quite honest, is a, a Republican dominated group, but they recognize this doesn't have a place in Southbury. And again, people referred back to this story, referred back to their parents or grandparents who signed that resolution I referred to, uh, to say that this is a menace uh, and, this, and needs to be obliterated. Uh, they use that as their way of expressing uh, that this is a reprehensible sign and has no place in Southbury. So I think it's a very useful story for us to keep coming back and grounding ourselves in our, uh, uh, in our morality and our ethics of what has happened here before. Uh, and I think if, if I could interrupt Arnie, please. There, yeah, it's important to realize that Reverend Lindsay was putting his hide on the line here. At one point, Gerhard Kuhns, uh, who was one of Kuhn, uh, Fritz Kuhns, K-U-N-Z-E, uh, one of his top lieutenants came to Reverend Lindsay's house to try to sell him, is like he was selling the timeshare, why, the, why it would be perfectly fine to have uh, this camp in the town. Um, and he said something to the effect that, you know, you, this is for our blonde haired, blue eyed Aryan children. As if on cue, uh, the three children of uh, Reverend Lindsay, all blonde haired, blue eyed, came running through the room, laughing and joking, uh, so, and Reverend Lindsay himself laughed. But he was receiving letters from people who were really frightened. Uh, one was from a, on a hotel stationery in New York, um, and the man detailed what life had been like for him back in Nazi Germany. Uh, it was, and it was genuinely frightening. Um, and this was a gentile man, not Jewish, and his his father was a pastor who was killed. Uh, his sisters had been brutally uh, sexually assaulted. His mother had died because she couldn't get medical care. And he had managed to get to America, but he was, he was still frightened. And he was, said he was forced to join the Bund in order to keep his businesses going. And there was a, a Reverend Lindsay, in fact, was so protective of this man that he scratched out the name with a heavy marker. So that he kept the letter, but scratched out the name so people wouldn't know who he was. Uh, there was another letter that came he, he destroyed because it was just so terrifying. Uh, there was an incident where 
black cars were driving through Southbury. I think some of you might have more information on that than I did. And didn't Lois feel that somebody had possibly come into the house at night? They weren't sure what had happened. Well, um, no, she te- when she came up for the premiere, we hadn't known this before, but she, when we took her to her, the, the parsonage where she used to live, uh, she related that they had ransacked the house, but didn't take anything, implying that they were looking for something like these letters that Arnie's referring to. Uh, and uh, then went on, uh, Lois went on to remind or, or to recall how her father took her up into the attic to where he hid the letters that people from all over the, the U.S. And, and further wrote to him, and he would hide them in the rafters in the attic so they would be hard to find. And as if, even though she was only 10 years old, he entrusted her with that information so that she would know it. So there was fear there that I, I think is hard for us to recognize sometimes uh, was going on in the U.S. prior to World War II. Again, we think that's, that fear was only in Europe. Well, and just to jump in here, I mean, that fear is here in the U.S., um, but we have to remember that this is before, this is 1937, so Germany has not taken Austria or the Sudetenland, Kristallnacht has not happened yet, the outbreak of World War II has not begun yet and won't for another two years after um, what happens in Southbury happens. And so there is this gradual ramp up that will get um, even more serious, and it still takes the United States four years after Southbury, after 1937, to actually fully engage in the war and fully commit to um, going after the Nazis. And so you have what's happening in Southbury, and, and all of that fear is happening even before um, a lot of the, the kind of crises are erupting in Europe. And uh... Rebecca, um, within uh, also within this context, so what is the significance of this story vis-a-vis early warning signs of genocide? I think this is a great story to look at early warning signs for genocide and really how to disrupt them. So if you think about kind of the early warning signs that lead to genocide, genocides often begin with words, with marginalizing and dehumanizing, and then with laws. And the leaders of these movements that become genocidal count on nobody standing up. And I'm not saying that the Bund was genocidal in the United States or that they would have ever had gotten that support there, but the words that they are using, um, the words that Fritz Kuhn is using are about taking over the country. They're about Der Tag, the day in which fascism will rise again in the US. And so the Southbury story reminds us that you don't have to wait until there is a nationwide crisis to act. Um, If you see a crisis in your neighborhood, you can address it then. And sometimes you're addressing it in something that seems as benign as zoning laws. Um, Sometimes that is enough uh, to disrupt this kind of ideology. Um, But it is really important uh, to to decide what kind of ideology you want in your midst and what kind of ideology you don't. And Southbury was really on the forefront of saying, this does not belong in our town. And just to bounce off that, it's important to remember that the vast majority of German Americans were very much against the German-American Bund. Uh, there, as I was saying before, there was a camp in Grafton, Wisconsin, which is about 40 miles outside of uh, Milwaukee. And the German-American society there were furious about this. In fact, they built a park, uh, Schurz Park, S-C-H-U-R-Z, which was named after a German immigrant who had been a hero during the Civil War. And they put it deliberately near the uh, near Camp uh, Van Steuben, so that when the German American Bund would march from the train to the camp there, they would see this and they would see people who would stand up to it. When they had, you know, the German American Bundes, you know, standing outside with their uniform, the mayor of the town said, "If you want to wear a uniform, we have perfectly fine police department here. Why don't you just join the navy or something like that?" They were very much fighting what was going on at Camp Van Steuben. It, it, people stood up. German Americans stood up. You know, it would. Part of, you know, what, what I think was interesting that the book "It Can't Happen Here," by Sinclair Lewis, which takes place in Vermont, but the town that he describes is very much like Southbury. And in that it, it, that novel, and I think everybody should read this novel. It, the fascism takes hold, but there is a small band that 
sticks together and fights against this. And Southbury was that in real life. And good people stood up and continue to stand up to these things. And as long as, you know, I mean, I don't remember who said it, but the definition of evil is good people doing nothing. Well, people are standing up. And we're seeing evidence of that every day. Sure, these movements are there. Um, I went to high school in Skokie, Illinois, when the uh, Nazis, they were a bunch of mopes, wanted to march uh, through Skokie, Illinois. The people stand up. And that's really the important lesson of Southbury and beyond, is that when people stand up, these elements can be defeated. I don't know, but certainly put back in their boxes. And if I could spring off of that, one of the opportunities that Rabbi Eric and I have had is to work with a local educator whose focus is on, uh, on uh, diversity and cultural competence. And she took uh, my little book and using the, uh, the uh, anti-racism uh, uh, framework, uh, took the book and made it into a curriculum for fourth graders over a four day or five day period. And uh, one of the key uh, themes we try to get across in the educator's guide is to use this story to talk about really many things, but two of them being being an upstander, not just being a bystander. And the other that we've all been talking about is the importance of words, the words that Reverend Lindsay used in this particular case. And for those who have seen the documentary, and obviously for those who will now definitely see the documentary, uh, some of the most uh, important words to me are when Rabbi Eric says that we often forget how important words are. And Lindsay and others, there were others involved, uh, use words to galvanize a community. And to me, that's the most important part of this story. Uh, and we just need more communities that will find that kind of voice to move forward. Hopefully through teaching it to younger children, we'll see that in the future. I think, we, sorry, oh, please go, go right ahead. Please. I was going to say, I think, I think Southbury is also really important when we look at the history as a whole. It's not just an object lesson in, in standing up and in words, but it also really informs us about American response to the Holocaust generally. So we, I think there's often a perception that Americans didn't know anything, didn't do anything, or, or that we knew everything that was happening and didn't do anything. And the Southbury story shows us that there was a strong recognition in a small town in Connecticut of what the Nazis stood for, what the Bund stood for, and that this was something that they did not want. Um, and they stood up. And so Americans did know a lot of information and they did things about it. In fact, they were a subject of probably the most popular medium uh, in America, the newsreel. And a whole newsreel series was done on Southbury. They came in, they reenacted some of the things as well. But this was a coast to coast story. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, when you buy Melinda's book, um, you'll get the backstory uh, of how much they they were paid and and when they wanted to do it and not want to do it. Um, uh, it I, I realize that, uh, and this is great that our hour is going so quickly. Um, uh, and uh, Sydney had told us over six hundred people uh, ha are joining us today, which is wonderful. Um, What's next for, uh, for getting this story out? Uh, Rebecca, um, the Holocaust Museum and its scholarship uh, um, uh, and this story, uh, can you share where you, where you all are headed or? Sure, so the exhibit uh, Americans and the Holocaust in Washington is still on display. Um, so if you can make it to Washington, you can come and see Reverend Lindsay's typewriter, uh, see some of the speeches, see the advertisement for the town meeting. Um, in 1937 on display at the museum. Um, we also have it completely uh, digitized, Reverend Lindsay's collection, and I can put that in the chat to everybody in case you want to, as Ed suggested you do, read uh, his sermon and look at some of the photos from that time. We also have a traveling version of this exhibition that is traveling to public libraries nationwide. Um, this is a story that, that we hope to continue and that we hope to promote um, from from the museum in Washington, and I do believe the newsreel. Yeah, the newsreel I think is on YouTube. I know I've seen it there, so it it should be readily available on YouTube. And and Arnie, your your upcoming project. Um, I'm actually going to be in a 
German uh, PBS, their, their version of public television. I'm going to be in a documentary this summer. Uh, we filmed it uh, last uh, spring. They're interested in this story worldwide. And this is a documentary. Germans are interested They're in what happened here. Um, so this is a documentary going to be um, broadcast in Germany on the German American Bone on Fritz Kuhn. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll be receiving American distribution as well. And uh, uh, Melinda, your upcoming book. Yes, you've been very good about advertising and, and giving little tidbits of what uh, to look forward to. Uh, my basic premise was to take the, the, the situation and look at it from the viewpoint of, of people in town, each individual um, and how they came together and their, their fights along the way and, and the, the funny things that happen. The, the book is called uh, No Swastikas in South Ferry. Great. Um, now, we, we have some questions which have been coming in uh, over the chat, and uh, there, I believe there may be some, uh, some other questions coming uh, as, uh, as well. Um, first one, and uh, Melinda, I'll, I'll look to you to sort of back me up here, was what was the Jewish community in Southbury? And let me answer part one of that. Yeah. There wasn't. Um, uh, there may have been one uh, Jewish family in Southbury uh, during this time. There, there were Jews in this neighborhood in Woodbury. Uh, there was a Jewish community and there were synagogues in, in Waterbury. Uh, and, uh, and certainly the Jewish community in Hartford, which has always been historically a very great Jewish community, was very focused on uh, what was happening here. And the Connecticut Jewish Ledger um, uh, was, was very well aware and very supportive of the actions which happened uh, uh, in uh, Southbury. Um, uh, will the, um, um, the documentary is, which we talked about was Home of the Brave. Uh, and I guess through here uh, was one of the ways of being able to access Home of the Brave. Uh, um, do we have other ways yet of being able to access Home of the Brave? Pretty soon. Pretty um, soon? Yeah, pretty soon. Probably the end of the month. And, and there was another companion piece, which was done as well, uh, which talks about the events when Southbury sought to honor it, which um, uh, is, is also a, a really uh, great, uh, great piece. Um, oh, and if people are interested in my book, um, please feel free to contact me via the internet. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> uh, now, some questions which came in. Um, uh, uh, First is, uh, uh, where were the organizers of the plan camp in Southbury based? Um, and so um, uh, they were uh, doing it, that the land was bought uh, by uh, a Bund member uh, in uh, Stanford. Uh, and um, and uh, they were trying to, to look at things uh, uh, from there. Uh, how did this large parcel of land get sold to the Bund organization or its leaders without being noted? Or was it just a commingling of a lot of small parcels that would go unnoticed? Uh, Melinda? Yes, there were actually three parcels that were put together, but they were previously previously put together for uh, a different company ten years um, before that. Um, that yes, it was it wasn't easy. To, it was okay. Sorry, it was not hard to sneak it through because at that time. Um, the state of Connecticut was buying property all over Southbury for the uh, state hospital. There was also a front organization called the German American Business League, um, German, the German American Businessmen's League. And they, they were a front for a lot of the bun uh, purchases, such as things like Southbury and, and other things as well. But this one was only was one individual. Yeah, I think he was with, though, the German American Businessmen's League, though. Um, another question which came in uh, on the chat, um, and uh, we may not have addressed, I don't think we've addressed this specifically, was uh, why did the Bund come to Southbury? Uh, why was Southbury selected as the site uh, for this camp? It was in my notes. I forgot to tell you. I'm so sorry. Um, the um, Stanford Bund decided that they were, well, they decided that they were going to uh, expand into Connecticut as the gateway to New England. They went to Bridgeport, uh, New Haven, Waterbury, 
and Danbury to see if they could find any Germans um, to, to continue um, to, to make uh, units. However, they did find people, but they were mostly the old Germans, but they thought there was enough new, the newer Germans that they could um, make a camp here, right in the middle of Southbury's, right in the middle of those um, big towns. And there was also a German community already here that was considering being part of a unit. And these camps were nationwide too. Um, it's very important to point that out. There were, I think maybe 15 to 20 that they knew about. There was a major one in Los Angeles. Uh, I think there's one outside St. Louis, certainly the one in Wisconsin. And the majority of them were on the East Coast. And uh, another question which came in, and I think that uh, Arnie, perhaps you, or perhaps Rebecca, uh, uh, one of our uh, participants, or one of our uh, folks watching us today, uh, wrote, it seems to me that Southbury's courage in stopping the camp is the first serious blow to the Bund and to Fritz Kuhn. How important is this one event as a catalyst for the downfall of the Bund? Oh, it, it, it's vital. It showed that Americans were willing to stand up, willing to say no. People were frightened of the Bund. Um, they, they were generally frightened and of what was going on. They were holding Nazi marches in the streets of Brooklyn, for goodness sake. And they had their, their flags. They were you know, spouting all this ideology. And here is a town that stood up and said, no, this is not America. And you are not American to do this kind of thing. It's so un-American. Southbury's story is, is vital to the story of how the German-American Bund fell. Uh, another, if I could just, uh, you know, a little um, uh, uh, kudos for us for what we did, because I think Arnie will tell us that despite all the research he'd been doing on the German-American Bund, until he saw things in our local newspaper that we were putting this documentary together, he had been unable to find anything about it. So we were really off the radar, Southbury, as far as a story to be told. And uh, for a small town like us to go from no one knowing about our story in 1937 to now being part of a, uh, an exhibit in Washington, DC and a, and a well-revered, uh, well um, uh, thought of book, uh, I think is quite an accomplishment to go from Kind of zero to 60 since we uh, put the documentary together. One of my fattest files was from Southbury. Um, you guys sent me plenty of stuff and uh, it, well documented too. Um, kudos to you on, on the excellent documentation. I wish I could have gone further with it, with the story. There was so much information. Yeah, and we learned about the story because of the film. So if you hadn't done the film, I don't know that we would have been able to tell that story as well. Right. And somebody who came to one of our exhibits uh, when we were showing the film, uh, who was involved with the museum, uh, uh, sort of brought it. So, yeah, one thing built so much upon another. Um, we've been looking at Southbury. Uh, how did the rest of Connecticut react to the establishment of this camp or the potential uh, or the effort? And, and I know that, uh, Melinda, if you can share who else was in Southbury uh, the night of those town meetings and what was uh, the other vibe going within uh, uh, Connecticut? There were a lot of uh, people from out of town that came to the town meetings um, because they wanted to see what was going on. I, um, the first selectmen from Waterbury, from Woodbury, from Roxbury, they all came to, to um, support Southbury. As for people who were um, writing against the Bund, their letters um, at the state capitol right now, piles of letters from just um, some people who definitely did not want the Bund in Connecticut. Great. Uh, now, uh, I ask our, uh, our, our panelists, uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Besides buy my book? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've already done that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the really important lesson, I've, I said this before, is that because of Southbury, we can see that we good people standing up and speaking up and sometimes putting themselves in a dangerous place can stop these kind of elements. And these elements are still out there. 
Um, and we need people who are willing to be strong and stand up, um, as well as people who are gathering together in groups as well. Yep, civic participation. As Melinda said, writing letters. Somebody wrote a letter 85 years ago, and we're talking about it today. And so if there's a cause you care about, stand up and write a letter and, and join a club and get involved. So we thank our panelists for such a thoughtful and important conversation. I learn so much whenever I'm with you. Thank you so much. Um, now, thank you. Uh, Hillel said, uh, and uh, the English, uh, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when now? That ancient sage Hillel's famous maxim, which I've just quoted, speaks to us always. And especially as we observe Yom HaShoah, as we observe Holocaust Remembrance Day this very week. So let us continue to seek out and publicize these models of empathy uh, and of action. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Sydney. Yeah, I would like to echo what the rabbi said. Thank you all so much. I also have learned a lot. Um, and I would like to thank you, Eric, for moderating today. I think uh, we all learned so much because of your uh, leadership in this conversation. Um, and I'd like to thank you all out there in the internet for joining us. Um, and I would also like to thank South Britain Congregational Church and the Jewish Federation of Western Connecticut for co-presenting today's program. Um, everything we do at the museum is made possible through donor support. Uh, to those of you watching, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support the museum or becoming a member and joining us for our upcoming programs, which you can check out at the link in the Zoom chat. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. Thank you again to our panelists and our moderator and have a great afternoon.